forward. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilized conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, welcome to Brazier with me, Bev Turner, standing in for Colin until six o'clock. Coming up live at five. Invest, train and innovate. The rallying cry to business leaders by the Chancellor Rishi Sunak during a speech last night. Speaking to the Confederation of British Industry, he promised businesses tax cuts if they help him boost productivity in the UK, but offered very little detail on how he'll support families through the cost of living crisis. Some business leaders suggest Rishi's announcement has put too much pressure on British business. Reaction from former CEO of Wix next. The United Nations says Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The conflict has cut off supplies from Ukraine's ports, which once exported vast amounts of cooking oil, as well as cereals like maize and wheat. We'll be joined by a professor of agricultural economics. And the debate this hour, should England call for independence and leave the UK? That's what Daily Mail columnist Peter Hitchin says in today's paper. He's going to join us after 4.30. And alongside me for the next two hours, having her say on the stories of the day, the editor of Conservative Woman, Cathy Gingle. But first, here are the latest news headlines. Bev, thank you. The top story, the Prime Minister has been told he won't receive a second fine for breaching Covid laws. The Metropolitan Police has now concluded its investigation into parties at Downing Street and Whitehall. In total, 126 referrals were made for fixed penalty notices for breaking lockdown rules during the pandemic. 83 people received fines. 28 of those were given between two and five referrals. In other news, a musician obsessed with a serial killer, Ted Bundy, has been jailed for life for the murder of Bobby Ann McLeod. The 18-year-old was hit twice in the head while she waited for a bus in Plymouth last November. Cody Ackland then put her in his car and bludgeoned her to death in a remote car park on Dartmoor. He'll serve a minimum of 31 years. Outside court, Detective Superintendent Mike West read out a statement on behalf of the teenager's family. 
I want Cody Ackland to know that he has taken away our world. We will never see her beautiful face or hear her laugh, see her get married or have the children that she so wanted. We've not been able to say goodbye to Bobby Ann and we can only imagine the things that he did to her. Well, in other news today, Downing Street denies blocking the Treasury from imposing on windfall tax on oil and gas companies. The Prime Minister's official spokesman has acknowledged reports of division between the departments, but insists Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are aligned on the issue. The Chancellor's under mounting pressure to produce a package of support after inflation hit a 40-year high. Rishi Sunak says the government's prepared to help families cope with rising costs. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says he wants the government to do more. People are really struggling with their bills. Inflation's up, prices are up, wages are down, and the government is imposing tax on them at the same time. And he's got no answers. Um, and he had the opportunity. One of the answers is staring the Prime Minister in the face, a windfall tax to reduce bills by up to £600 for those that most need it on the profits that oil and gas companies didn't need, uh, didn't expect to make. I think the Prime Minister will U-turn on this, um, but the, by the time he's done that, so many people will have struggled with their bills for so much longer. The United Nations is warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The UN Secretary-General says the situation could lead to tens of millions of people facing food insecurity and famine. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies. The wars led to soaring global prices. Antonio Guterres has appealed to Moscow to allow the safe export of grain stored in Ukrainian ports. Meanwhile, Moscow claims that over 750 more Ukrainian fighters have surrendered in the Russian-held port city of Mariupol. Negotiations have been ongoing between the two sides to evacuate soldiers holed up at the Azovstal steelworks. According to Russia, it brings the total number of Ukrainian fighters to leave the plant since Monday to 1,730. It's unknown how many remain. Ukrainian officials have declined to comment on the fate of the soldiers. More than 50,000 refugees have arrived in the UK after fleeing the war in Ukraine. Official figures show almost 54,000 people came over under the Family and Homes for Ukraine sponsorship schemes. Around 128,000 of those applied for visas, but just over half who've been issued with one have arrived. The government's failed in its duty of care to doctors during the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to the British Medical Association. Its own review into the government's handling of the crisis highlights the lack of personal protective equipment in the early stages. It found that more than four in five doctors said they didn't feel adequately protected during the first wave of the virus. The Royal Mail says it will need to increase its prices and cut costs by more than £350 million amid rising inflation. The firm says it faces higher wage demands and steeper energy and fuel costs. Royal Mail insists no further job losses are planned. That's after announcing in January that 700 managerial positions would go. And the UK's biggest ever lottery winners have been revealed. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million jackpot on a lucky dip ticket. The Gloucester couple, who've been married for 11 years, said they now have time to dream. Good for them. You're with GB News. More news as it happens. Now back to Beth. Good afternoon, I'm Bev Turner. This is GB News. Now, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has called on businesses to help ease the cost of living pressures by boosting investment and training in order to grow the economy. He made the comments in a speech at a Confederation of British Industry dinner last night, where he also warned that there was no easy fix for the cost of living crisis. He said that government action could only go so far and that support was needed from the private sector. We need you, the wealth creators, the entrepreneurs, the leaders. 
We need you to invest more, train more, and innovate more. And as I've said previously, our firm plan is to reduce and reform your taxes to support you to do all three of those things. That is the path to higher productivity, higher living standards, and a more prosperous and secure future. The Chancellor also said there would be some relief for businesses with a cut on investment tax rates in the autumn. So joining me now is Bill Grimsey, a businessman and former CEO of Wix. Uh, Bill, first of all, your reaction to Rishi Sunak's statement, please. Well, my immediate reaction is that, of course, businesses can help the economy by investing in, in, their, in their products, their people and their training. However, I think it's important to get a message back to uh, the Chancellor that we have just come out of a pandemic and there are some very serious things that government needs to address in order to create conditions for businesses to succeed. And they are, first of all, deal with the business rate uh, problem, which is massive and is crippling, particularly small businesses up and down the, the, the country. And they keep kicking that can down the road. The second thing that they can do is to look at the loans that were given out to very small independent businesses during the, the pandemic, when in fact those businesses could not justify borrowing money, and look at how you can relieve them of that burden, because many of them are going to go out of business, particularly in the health and beauty sector. And then the third thing that they can do is look at how we stimulate uh, our town centres particularly through investment which is aided by government and get rid of this ridiculous um, process where you have to bid for money and you either get something or you get nothing. And uh, the government is aware of all of those challenges and we put them to them uh, in the Grimsey reviews which were published in June of last year which is the um, uh, Against All Odds independent business uh, uh, challenges. And uh, so I agree that the that, that, that government should call upon businesses to help the economy. We've all got to help each other. But when we've got ridiculous situations like the overhang for, from Brexit, the supply chain things to, to deal with, and in particular rumours that they're considering an online sales tax, which is government interfering mm -hmm. with the of goods, and they shouldn't be doing that either. That's definitely not something for government to do. It, they could. Sorry. It is, Bill. Sorry. It, it is the it is the the perfect storm for businesses at the moment, as you say, with with all of the supply chain issues, which um, perhaps are. But Brexit is partly responsible for the for the change that we're still experiencing um, off the back of that. We've also had a government which has given away a lot of money for furlough. And can I just ask you a little bit about that? Because you said that some of these businesses can't pay them back. Explain what, what you mean by that, because a lot of us have been reading in the paper how a lot of businesses, uh, are, to the tune of, I think, about 17 billion of those loans will never get paid back to the taxpayer. And that, that concerns us as taxpayers. Well, I don't recognise the 17 billion number. But I do recognise that the independent businesses, the small ones that we all rely on up and down the country, the hairdresser, the local shops, the independent shops, they took out loans that were made available to them, which their balance sheets could not justify. If they, in, in, in normal times, if they'd gone to a bank to get those loans, they would not have been able to justify them. But because the government back these loans, they were made available, and now they're having to pay them back. And you're going to see more and more businesses default on that, and more and more closures on the high street. And we've already got closures back up at a very, very high rate, about 15% across the country. And uh, we mustn't forget that the small business sector is a very important sector. It's, it's always the big businesses that make the news, mm. but collectively, the small businesses need looking after. And a lot of these people obviously have their whole wealth based on, on what they're doing, and often their houses are on the line as well. So that okay. needs to be dealt with. 
It does. Uh, th thank you, Bill. Uh, uh, Bill Grimsey there, former uh, CEO of Wix, giving us, us that perspective. Um, we've got inflation, Cathy G Gingell. If I got your name wrong before. Gingell, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure that happens. Um, just we've got inflation at 9% at the moment. And, and as Bill just said then, for these businesses, they, they are dealing with a huge amount. And there's been a lot of uncertainty. This figure that I mentioned then of the money that we, we did loan out, the government gave away. Rishi Sunak found a magic money tree during COVID. Exactly. Astonishingly, he now says that he's helpless, yeah. which is an unusual word to ever hear a chancellor say. They like to say they have a lot of power to their elbow ordinarily. Um, what do we do now, Cathy, to well, help businesses? Well, I think it's extraordinary watching Rishi Sunak. He really has some gall. And it's astonishing that people are letting him get away with it. Um, he did reckless spending over lockdown, and lockdown crippled the economy far more than Brexit. So that, that's the bottom line. Those figures that, that you mentioned came from the National Audit Office. They're, they reviewed all these figures. They're down in paper. But nobody has really challenged them or asked Rishi Sunak mm. to resign on them. And it's understandable. Um, the gentleman from Wix, actually, or the former chairman, explained that they, they were given loans easily that they shouldn't have been given. Too easily, Too Kathy. easily. Well, that, that was the, 70, the 17 billion that possibly can't be paid back. Now, of that, there's 5 billion that's sheer fraud. Yeah. You know, so th this is really shocking and the man ought to have been made to resign. But what can we do? Your second part of the question. I mean, Keir Starmer says a windfall tax on oil and gas. Well, this is crazy. The more we follow a green a trillion pound green agenda, the more the price of oil and gas goes up. The more we carry on in the war with Ukraine, the more oil and gas goes up and the more profits they make because they're more in demand and more needed because green doesn't work. So the first thing Rishi should do and Boris should do, if I quite didn't really like calling them by their first names, mm -hmm. these men should do is stop their trillion pounds um, cost of their green net zero agenda. That's the cleanest, most direct way of, of pulling back, retrenching on this reckless government spending mm. that's put, put us all in the soup. It, it has put us all in the soup. I mean, I, you and I were exchanging glasses when Rishi Sunak was talking there because he has the confidence of of a man who would think that you, he's running the, one of the most successful economies in the world. How he'd styled it out, how he could stand there and say to the businesses, it is now your responsibility. I want you to train your employees. And, and there is some truth in that, of course yeah. there is. But it's like we, we've got this mess that we're in now, this post-lockdown yes. poverty situation we're staring at. Yeah. I and mean, we're calling it a cost of living crisis. Yeah. But this isn't necessarily because of the war in Ukraine, even though they no, would very no, much like it, us to look that way. It, it will tilt it into an... It is definitely tilting it into a worse position. And the fact that they're ratcheting up a war that is going to cause... Well, we knew it would cause a global food mm. crisis. I wrote about it. Economists were writing about it in in March, you know, really early on mm. in the stages of the war. But he is, they are astonishingly entitled, this government. They've got away with it and they've got away with it and they've got away with it. And the opposition has been lacklustre and hasn't had a principled position to take them on at. And as you say, wonderful, over COVID, they could do everything. There was nothing they couldn't act on. Now, oh dear, no, we can't act Absolutely. on the cost of living. OK, Cathy, well, you're with me for the next couple of hours. Cathy Gingell is here from the Conservative Woman. And Talking uh, of Ukraine, that's what we're going to discuss now, because, of course, Russia's invasion uh, could continue to cause a global food shortage lasting as long as four years, the United Nations has warned. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said supplies from Ukraine's ports, which are vital for exporting cooking oil and cereal, have been cut off. Now, prior to the conflict, the country was a world leader in producing bread, with four and a half million tonnes of agricultural produce per month going through its commercial docks. There are now fears that Russian President Vladimir Putin is weaponizing the world's dependence on Ukrainian produce to gain leverage over the, re the West. So joining me now is Professor of Agricultural Economics at the University of Exeter, Steve McCorriston. Good afternoon, Steve. Um, Good Ukrainian afternoon. agriculture wasn't something that many of us had really any idea of before this conflict started. Just explain to us how reliant we are on that country, not only in the UK, but also globally. 
Yeah, so Ukraine has always been a big producer of agricultural commodities. So um, around about 30% of global wheat supplies come from Ukraine and Russia. Sunflower, about half of sunflower supplies to the world market comes from Ukraine. And um, fertilizer as well is a big issue. So Ukraine is it's maybe not been in the news until recently, but in terms of um, world commodity markets, it's always been a big player. Not just the fact that they would normally ordinarily be exporting all of this, this grain to the rest of the world, but this is the time of year, isn't it, when they would be planting it. They would be um, providing the wheat for the following year, and that presumably is where this figure of four years comes from in terms of a potential food crisis. That's right. So I think the, the, you've got the immediate effect where supplies, current supplies can get out because of um, the blockage of ports, et cetera. But of course, one of the reasons why this crisis might be prolonged is because you can't get planting at the present time, which is going to have no kind of effects in, in future years. And even if the fields did come back into um, accessibility, there's issues about mines being there, et cetera. So part of the concern with Ukraine at the present time is not just that current prices have increased, but the production capacity in the future might be, you know, might, might be impacted by the current conflict, mm -hmm. which will therefore have no kind of effects over longer periods of time. Steve, has this situation caught the world napping in a sense? Because we've had this kind of corporate status quo uh, controlling the world's food for years, it's on, on regulated global markets and financial speculators, global food producers. If we ha Did we need a crystal ball to see this coming, Steve, or was it always an inevitability? Well, one of the characteristics of commodity markets, world food markets, is that you get these occasional spikes. So if you look back to 2008 and 2011, we had this spike in world, world markets for many commodities. And that was often due to a confluence of events. Um, but one of the things that we, we, in a sense, we don't learn, we, we know, but we don't learn from, is that these spikes that happen tend to be relatively short-lived. So they go up for some period of time, a relatively short period of time, but then we recover from them pretty quickly. I think what's different about this crisis is, given that it's a conflict and given the impact of the conflict, is that this spike or this rise in commodity prices might be much more prolonged than the spikes that we've had in the past. So having spikes in world food prices is not unusual, but then they tend to revert back to some more normal <laughs> level. This one is a bit different because of the uncertainty about how long the conflict will last for and what our responses might be. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Steve McCorriston there, a professor of agricultural economics. Thank you. Uh, Cathy, we're seeing it already in our supermarket trolleys, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. Um, do you think that some of the shops may be um, using this a little to their advantage and putting prices up already without any genuine reason to do so? I have to say that hadn't occurred to me. They've been saying that about the petrol pumps. I know that they are not passing on to the... Buyer, consumer, yeah. to the consumer. But having done my recent last shop in Aldi, I have to admit, I was sort of did find my interestingly, I shouldn't do an advert short for them, should I? But my shopping bill wasn't as inflated as I thought it might have been. But I think people are going to have to pick and choose where they shop very carefully. And that will that competition um will work. But I think even more worrying. Well, it's not more worrying than for us is what's happening in Africa. This this Ukraine war is is Russia war is going to is going to devastate Africa. If they're they're, they're going to be so badly impacted. Now this is not because already. they are even more reliant yes. on the wheat exports yes, and the exactly. maize and the corn and the and the grain yes. than we are. Yes. Well, I, I think we are. So we're cheap, but yeah. but I think there are some countries, um, Egypt, Turkey. Yes. Almost the tune yes. of 100% they get yes. their grain from, from exactly. that bread basket. And, and we're not Europe. tending to think about them. And the, the, the collateral damage of lockdown on their supply chains, on their economies, was absolutely devastating before this. And we're really, nobody's just really very interested in what's happening in Africa. And, I mean, we are, you know, it's just odd. It depends what the media pick up and what ball they run yeah. with. Um, but that ball hasn't been run with yet. And yes, I'm sure we're going to see empty shelves. Okay, all right, thank you.
OK, moving on. Thank you, Cathy. Now, the Prime Minister uh, will, not have to, will not face another lockdown fine for lockdown breaches in Downing Street. He must be delighted. Uh, the Metropolitan Police has concluded its Partygate investigation after issuing 126 fines, with 83 for events in Downing Street and across Whitehall over eight days. It was also confirmed that both the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, and the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie Johnson, hadn't been issued any additional fines. So joining me now is GB News political correspondent Tom Harwood. Uh, Tom, I imagine there are audible sighs of relief around you at the moment. What is the very latest down there in Westminster? Yes, it is a fairly extraordinary development uh, that uh, took place just to the, towards the end of this morning. Uh, I attended a, a lobby briefing with the Prime Minister's official spokesman earlier today when everyone was really quite questioning whether the Prime Minister had really had no further fines at all. Because, of course, we've remembered how this story has run and run and run for the past almost six months now with various stories of uh, parties that broke swings parties involving suitcases full of alcohol parties that seemed fairly raucous, some with makeshift DJs and all the rest of it. But I think it's important to make the distinction, as clearly the Metropolitan Police have done, between those parties that were carried out with relatively junior members of staff across the sprawling complex that is Downing Street and Whitehall versus those that the Prime Minister himself attended. Because, of course, for most of those headline-grabbing events, the Prime Minister was not actually in the building. Of course, those raucous parties that broke the swings or involved suitcases of alcohol, the Prime Minister isn't alleged to have been at those. No, the one event that the Prime Minister was uh, fined for, did receive a fixed penalty notice for, was a re relatively innocuous event. And that meant people thought that the uh, level, the bar for which people may be fined, was relatively low. But it seems as though the police has come to a different conclusion. After months, months and months of reviewing stacks of evidence with a really quite expensive investigation. Half a million pounds almost spent on this investigation over the course of the last few months. And here is where we've ended up. Now, I suppose the question turns to next week, where Sue Gray's report will be published and the Prime Minister will respond to all of the detail of everything that has happened over the past few months in the House of Commons. And once that's done, I suppose the question turns to to Durham Police and Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom Harwood there down in Westminster. Half a million pounds trying to get to the bottom of that, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, you heard that correct. OK, I am Bev Turner, exasperated, uh, standing in for Colin Brazier. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up, two more people in the UK have been diagnosed with monkeypox, taking the total number of cases to nine. The rare infection is usually linked with travel in West Africa. Microbiologist Dr. Simon Clark will give us the details next. We'll be back in just a moment. Tonight on GB News, at six, it's Deebs and Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At eight, join Mark Stein. And at nine, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. You're here with Bev Turner in for Colin Brazier on GB News, on TV and on your radio. OK, there's now a total of nine cases of monkeypox here in the UK after another two people with the virus have been identified. Now, if you're of a delicate disposition, you may find these images distressing. Uh, the UK Health and Security Agency says the virus does not usually spread easily and the risks for people is low, with the condition usually linked to travel in West Africa. Most of the confirmed cases in the UK have been identified in the southeast of England. So Dr. Simon Clark is a microbiologist at the University of Reading and can tell us more. Simon, I have so many questions, uh, but please just give us all a bit of background into the monkeypox virus. So this is a virus that was discovered in the 1950s, initially in monkeys, hence the name, but actually in the wild, you're more likely, I think, to find it in certain sort of African rodents. Uh, it didn't appear in humans until the 1970s, or it wasn't reported, and it's thought to have made that species jump uh, and continues to make that species jump because in certain parts of the world, people eat those animals and therefore consume the virus. Classically, it's been regarded as something that you transmit by a skin-on-skin -skin transfer, uh, but there is um, some evidence coming out of the Centers for Disease Control in the States, which is not a fly-by-night organization, which shows that there is the possibility of aerosolized transmission. So it might, might be possible to breathe it in as well. Why would that be the case now, though? If the CDC are saying it might be passed via aerosol, this isn't a virus which has changed, has it, over the years? So why would the transmission now be different? No, but to be frank, um, in the developed world, it doesn't kill that many people, infect that many people. It doesn't kill that many people globally compared to other things. So it falls right down the list of things that get studied and things that we know about. It's historically, well, over the past 50 to 70 years, not been something that's been a priority to study. So our knowledge base of it is limited compared to other things. The reports that we're hearing at the moment is that most of the, case, the cases so far are in uh, gay or bisexual men. Can you just explain to us why that might or might actually not be relevant? Well, I'm not sure that most are. I'm not sure that's actually true. Some certainly are. Um, uh, they have come in... Uh, people have presumably come into contact with somebody who has been infected. Um, and we don't know who that is or, or where they are. Um, and uh, they've picked it up from somewhere. So that means that there are people who are uh, um, uh, in society moving amongst us who've got this and don't know it, haven't realised it yet. But that is also just, true of uh, straight people as well as who, who, who have that's it. That's right. I just wanted to clarify, Simon, it's not like, you know, I remember the 80s when we heard of AIDS for the first time and it was assumed this was something within the gay community. I just wanted us to clarify that that isn't, that there is no comparison to be made here. No, there is no comparison to be made at all. Um, it just happens to have cropped up in that uh, group of people. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Simon Clark, there, a microbiologist from the University of uh, Reading. Uh, Kathy Gingell is still with me. 
Um, do we have any fears about a new pandemic with monkeypox? We, we, we have a fear about the CDC, I think. <laughs> <laughs> The CDC. You mean you don't trust the CDC I with your life, Cathy? Absolutely, don't trust the CDC with my life, and nor should anybody. It seems to be highly politicised, and you'll be worried about this when I tell you I just checked this out before I came. And the US, it's not the CDC, but it's an Associated Biomedical United States Security Agency, has already exercised options to supply freeze-dried version of smallpox vaccine, and I mean it's. And they're, and they're ordering the first 13 million doses. I, I just don't know. I know that's different. I know it's not monkeypox, but I always just get a little bit worried if they say it's aerosol trap. We're you know. all slightly on tenterhooks. There are various words that trigger us after yes. the last two years, but Cathy. OK, um, right, coming up, we're going to debate the big topic of the day as I ask, should England call for independence and leave the UK? That is what Daily Mail columnist Peter Hitchens says in today's paper. He's going to be joining us to debate that next. But first, let's bring you up to date with the latest news headlines. Thank you. The top story is Boris Johnson has been told he won't receive a second fine for breaching COVID laws. The Met Police has now concluded its investigation into parties at Downing Street and Whitehall at a cost of £460,000. A total of 126 referrals have been made for fixed penalty notices. A musician obsessed with the serial killer Ted Bundy has been jailed for life for the murder of Bobby Ann McLeod. The 18-year-old was hit twice in the head while she waited for a bus in Plymouth in November last year. Cody Ackland later killed her in a remote car park on Dartmoor. He'll serve a minimum of 31 years. Number 10 denies blocking the Treasury from imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. The Prime Minister's official spokesman has acknowledged reports of division between the two departments, but insists Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are aligned on the issue. The Chancellor is under mounting pressure to produce a package of support after inflation hit a 40-year high. And the United Nations is warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The UN Secretary General says the situation could lead to tens of millions of people facing food insecurity and even famine. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies. The wars led to soaring global prices. The UK's biggest ever lottery winners have been revealed. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million on a lucky dip ticket hitting the jackpot. The Gloucester couple, who've been married for 11 years, say they now have time to dream. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB Plus, you're with GB News and we're here with more in just a moment. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. A quick snapshot for you of today's markets. The pound is 1.249 to the dollar and 1.181 to the euro. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,477.88 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. This is GB News, you're with me Bev Turner on TV, online and on digital radio. The top story is just after 4.30 this afternoon. The Chancellor is facing increasing pressure to offer more support for families struggling with the cost of living crisis. Rishi Sunak says the government will act where it can, but it won't be easy to cut costs for families. The police investigation into Downing Street parties has concluded with a total of 126 fines handed out to 38 people. Downing Street say there will be no further action against the Prime Minister, who has already received one fine over a birthday gathering. His wife Carrie and Chancellor Rishi Sunak also received a fine. And a couple from Gloucester have announced they are the lucky winners of the UK's biggest ever Euro Millions win. Joe and Jess Thwaites won a record-breaking £184 million last week, and that makes them richer than Adele. Lucky them. Now, lawmakers and representatives from the European Commission have been debating alleged war crimes committed in Ukraine today, hours after a Russian soldier pleaded guilty to killing an unarmed civilian in the country. The 21-year-old made the plea in the first war crimes trial in Ukraine since the war started. Vadim Shishamarin admitted shooting a 62-year-old man a few days after the invasion began. He faces life in jail. Ukraine has so far identified more than 10,000 possible war crimes committed by Russia. I'm joined by former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton now. Uh, John, how significant is the first war crimes trial in Ukraine? Well, I think it's very important uh, and a demonstration that the government of Ukraine uh, continues to function, that it can conduct the trial, uh, that adheres to standards of due process. Uh, I think uh, it'll be hindered down the road, uh, as would any other court, by the absence of the defendants, many of whom may uh, be exchanged for uh, Ukrainian uh, prisoners of war, people coming out of Mariupol. But I think it demonstrates the fundamental point that, uh, that Ukraine as a nation uh, is conducting investigations in many, many different locales, uh, is conducting them uh, according to the kinds of standards that we would expect, and that uh, at this point, uh, I, don't, I don't see any need for anybody else, uh, any other judicial institution to get in. I think at some point we're going to need to see in a Russia under a different regime, uh, Russian war crimes trials where the people of Russia hold uh, officials accountable for things that were purportedly done in their name. That's obviously down the road, though. Uh, Moscow has denied that its troops have targeted civilians, but investigators have been collecting evidence of possible war crimes uh, to bring before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. How easy is it to do that, to gather this sort of evidence at a time like this? I think there were many of us that were surprised to think that a case had already been brought to court when you feel like we're, we're in the middle of the conflict. Uh, it's true, and the conflict will go on. But I think the circumstances where Russian troops withdrew from a number of areas uh, in the northern part of Ukraine where uh, they had initially uh, invaded and held territory for a while has opened the possibility for, for these investigations to proceed. 
my, my own view is the International Criminal Court is the last place you want to go. I think it's an illegitimate institution fundamentally. Uh, and in theory, at least, uh, the members of the ICC, of which the United States is not one, but the members should have primary responsibility. And there would have to be some showing Ukraine uh, can't proceed in a responsible way. So I think the uh, uh, Ukrainian investigations to date, and I'm sure there will be more, but I think they've shown the capacity of the Ukrainian government. There may be outside assistance that can be provided. But from what I've seen from the media reports and other indications I've had, uh, I think you can commend the government of Ukraine for, for proceeding as expeditiously uh, and as broadly as they can, given the circumstances. Um, given that there are still troops on the ground there in Ukraine, uh, do you fear that Russian soldiers might try to hide the evidence, destroy evidence before it is found to cover their tracks? Uh, I don't have any doubt that's what they're doing. And I think they've seen when they've withdrawn from areas where uh, civilians were killed and buried in mass graves, those graves are being uncovered. Uh, so I think from, from the point of view of the Russians, it's, uh, it's inexplicable that their commanders uh, would have allowed this kind of uh, lack of discipline to be displayed. Uh, and, but it shows how pervasive the problem is within, uh, within the Russian army. And this is going to have to be uh, something when, when we come to a point of holding Russia accountable or deciding what relations between the United States, Britain and Europe uh, on the one hand and Russia on the other hand are going to be. Uh, what we expect from Russia to assume their own responsibility. And that really is where we have to look, because for Russia to mature to the point where this doesn't happen again, if they don't take responsibility for it, having it imposed from the outside isn't going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much, John. That was John Bolton there, a former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. and U.S. national uh, security advisor. Uh, Kathy? thoughts on this? Well, Were you, like me, surprised to see that there was already a, a case in court? I'm afraid I feel there's a propaganda war going on that's as powerful as the actual war on the ground. And um, I would think the Ukrainians, I'm very cynical, would have a big interest in trying to demonstrate that they're doing crimes. Quite clearly, some of their regiments will have been involved in crimes. Mm -hmm. They're Azov regiments. We know already that in the period between 2014 and the present, um, the treatment of people in Donbass and the Donetsk have probably not been good. And there's a French journalist at the moment taking testimonies from the treatment of those people who are imprisoned. Yes, he's a pro-Donbass activist, but we must have to be very aware that we're only really hearing about one side of this war. And I'm afraid Mr. Bolton has a very neocon regime change history and position that I think a lot of people think um, retrospectively was a terrible mistake. I, yeah, I, there, there is probably... I have no doubt there is some truth in what you say, Cathy, but I think we have to keep coming back to the fact that on, in the, on the ground in Ukraine, there are families, there are children, there are normal people like you and I whose lives have been completely changed, um, but, but as you say, by the actions of, of possibly not just one man, but anyway. Right, it is time for the debate this hour. OK, we are joined by the Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens. He has called for England to withdraw itself from the UK, as he described, giving up trying to persuade other nations to remain in the Union. He says it wouldn't technically be English independence, since England has never depended on any other countries in the Union, but rather a restoration of England. So is it time to abandon the project of the Union, or should, should we still hold on to hope? Peter Hitchens, are you being deliberately provocative. Yes. <laughs> what would we expect? Well, are you or do you... No, really, I am being deliberately Do you really believe But I also this? think it's absolutely true. I, why stand around waiting to be, with a wilting bunch of flowers, waiting to be jilted by the other three, uh, the other three countries in, in the United Kingdom? They all want to go. They keep saying so. So uh, let's not wait around and, and be passive about it. Let's rejoice in the fact that we have the opportunity to be as we were before we got mixed up with all these other countries, they don't want to stick around. So, fine, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'd welcome them all back if they wanted to come back, leave a light burning and nothing against them, like them all. But if they want to go, let them go. And you, let's uh, let's beat them to it. But that I would sound just love, a heart breaking all no, over loved, the country, I, Peter, one of which see, is mine. I'd love to be in Nicola Sturgeon's office in Edinburgh when the phone call comes through from London saying, Nicola, you've got what you want. As of tonight, you're, you're independent. Great, have a good time. 
and goodbye and see how she takes it. I'm not sure that, that these independence merchants in, in the other parts of the United Kingdom actually want to reach, they love campaigning for it, but the actual hard business of, of experiencing it may be something different. But so there is some mischief in what I say, but I actually, I do find the word England fills me with a strange uh, emotional power. I like to hear about England and English things. I am English. I'm also Cornish, I should add, but I oh, and, don't a, a start number of other things well. too. But I, don't, I, I would like to live in England again, since, 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 since we're being propelled towards that. Let's get on with it before okay. I die. I haven't so, got all that long to go. Well, you, do, you do live in England, Peter, and the England is part of, of Great Britain. We are part of the United Kingdom. Cathy, is your heart breaking to hear this idea of this, this well, impending divorce that, that he's cheerleading I, on? I, so, so, you know, this all began with devolution, really. It probably began before that. But we've 300 years been in the union with Scotland over, haven't we? We've had lots of sort of Scottish prime ministers of Britain. We've had... It feels very narrow-minded to me. Um, Scots, Welsh, English... Irish, we've all contributed to each other culturally, literary and economics, everything. Um, I just feel it's giving up because we've got a mad woman called Nicola Sturgeon running Scotland who's pushed a sort of the poor Scots into this dire Stalinist sort of woke agenda. Well, I don't seem to um, object to it, Cathy. Also, I'm not talking about well, chucking... people aren't objecting to about, Boris Johnson talking, here, and well, they should be. I'm, I'm, not, I mean, I'm not talking about <laughs> chucking out the, the Scots, the Welsh and the Irish. I, I'm very delighted if they stay... Um, if they stay in, the, in fact, one of the triumphs of what was otherwise a terribly bodged Irish independence mm -hmm. in the 1920s was that it was absolutely the case that the Irish peoples living here, continue to live here, could vote and have all the rights they previously had. And the common travel agreement, everybody could come and go. But as far as I'm concerned, our doors should always remain open. It's, but if they want to be politically independent, and that, that means that, that England, which at the moment is, is one of the very few major cultures in the world with no political expression of itself, can once again become a nation calling itself England. We can stop having to refer to the UK everywhere we go. We have no uh, political expression uh, of our own, Cathy. Have any. I like... Well, I like... Well, I don't know. I like the British Isles, really. I always like the British Isles. I like to say I'm British. Um, I think I've got bits of... Scot well, you said you don't want to go down there. I've definitely got bits of Celtic and bits of God knows what in me. So we're, we're all sort of so muddled up. We've been fighting each other across the border for so long. We probably carry on fighting each other, but... I don't know. This feels like we're going to become like Catalonians or Basques. Next, we'll have the Republic no, of Yorkshire. No, no, look, you know, this is another of... very important thing about <laughs> this. We need we need to understand. I, I, I glory in our history. I think it's the most tremendous history of, of, of liberty under law, of uh, of exploration, of spreading to other parts of the world things which are good. There are obviously bad things about the British Empire, and I, coming from a naval family, feel particularly. Uh, proud of the, the, the enormous sea power we once had in this very small country, which we are physically, actually being, for some important years, the most powerful nation on the globe. But it's over, and we should stop fantasising about it, stop imagining that we're still a superpower, stop wanting to st stomp about in other people's countries, and we're stomping around in Iraq, stomping around in Libya, stomping around in Syria, stomping around in Ukraine. None of our business. If you look at the contented countries of Europe, they're countries which have often former empires, which have come to the conclusion that they have a perfectly good future without having to worry about that. Uh, you look at the Netherlands, or you look at Austria, or Denmark, all kinds of countries that have, have far higher levels of contentment and success than we have because they've shed their illusions about being great powers. We're not a great power. Nobody in the outside world takes us seriously as a great power. We look at, read, read American newspapers, watch American television. We're barely mentioned. They hardly know we exist. But we think we're important. I we would, need to realise we, we're important. And I, way. Um, Peter Hitchens, when you talk, I listen, and I would love to carry on. I knew this. I could that carry was, on. I, too. I, I would love to can't. carry on too. I knew this is going to be the can't get a word in edgeways bit. Away, but um, you've made us think. You always make us think. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Okay, right. We do have to move on. Uh, you are listening to Bev Turner in for Colin Brazier on GB News TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up after the break. I'll give you the rundown of today's five to five. Five stories you need to know before five o'clock. But first, let's take a quick look at the weather. Hi there, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Following the excitement of last night's thunderstorms, there have been a few more showers today, but actually most places are dry with sunny spells and high pressure ridging up from the south has allowed for light winds. So a pleasant end to Thursday for the vast majority. But the low out to the northwest will bring some more showers in during the next few days. We keep the clear spells into the evening for much of England and Wales, eastern and southern Scotland as well. Cloud coming and going for western Scotland, northern Ireland. The showers easing off and then perhaps returning for the far northwest 
later in the night. And then the cloud thickens from the south during the early hours with temperatures in the south 11 or 12 Celsius, further north 9 to 11 generally. So it's a cloudy but also damp start to Friday as rain makes an appearance. Central southern England initially and then some heavier and more persistent rain for a time towards the southeast. Meanwhile, further west and north, showers or longer spells of rain move in from the west. And uh, Western Scotland seeing the most damp weather. It will also feel cool. 16 for Glasgow, 17 for Aberdeen, 19 for London. There'll be some bright weather in between the showers, but I think for Scotland, Northern England, we'll see more persistent rain, a spell of a rain for an hour or two as we go into the evening. That then clears away, clear spells for many to start off the night, and we'll see just a few showers for Western Scotland, but otherwise mostly dry. 11 or 12 Celsius as we start off the weekend, a bit cooler in sheltered spots, but plenty of bright weather around actually. Eastern Scotland, central and eastern England, parts of Wales doing well for sunshine first thing. Generally it will turn cloudier into the afternoon for the vast majority and there'll be one or two showers mostly towards the north. Sunday brings with it more showers again especially towards the north, warmer and drier southeast. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good afternoon, it is time for five to five uh, as we discuss five things you need to know before five o'clock. It is the final day of the Wagatha Christie trial as closing arguments have been made in the libel case brought on by Colleen Rooney's accusation that Rebecca Vardy leaked stories about her to the Sun newspaper. GB News reporter Ellie Costello is at the Royal Courts of Justice. It's been a trial that's dominated social media and the headlines of the papers for the last seven days. But today was the last day of the so-called Wagatha Christie trial. Uh, closing arguments came from Colleen Rooney's barrister, David Sherborne, this morning. He called Rebecca Vardy a highly unreliable witness whose true nature is to be a leak. Well, this afternoon was the turn of Rebecca Vardy's barrister, Hugh Tomlinson. He said that Rooney's legal team had been spouting conspiracies. Well, as expected, Mrs. Justice Stain has retired uh, to consider her judgment, and we're expecting to hear that in the next few weeks. At four, new research suggests Brits are more likely to be obese than a healthy weight by the end of the decade. 
Cancer research says if the current trend continues, there'll be an extra 6 million obese people by 2040, calling the figures a wake-up call for the government. At three, last week we heard there was a lucky winner who'd be taking home the UK's biggest Euro Millions jackpot. Well, today we found out who it is. It's a couple from Gloucester who got themselves a lucky dip ticket. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million, making them richer than Adele. At two, soon we could be bringing up, we could be binging, sorry, on a new documentary featuring, you guessed it, Prince Harry and Meghan. The couple are said to be filming an at-home docu-series with Netflix. The Sussexes have welcomed cameras into their $14 million home for the reality series. And at number one tonight, Diana Ross, Queen and Adam Lambert and, and Sir Rod Stewart will perform at a star-studded concert to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The Platinum Party at the Palace will be watched by 22,000 people live and it will be broadcast on TV on the 4th of June. Those are the five things you might want to know before five o'clock this afternoon. OK, let's discuss some of those stories with the editor of The Conservative Woman, Cathy Gingell, is still here with me. Which one caught your eye, Cathy? Well, I thought it was probably the, um, the one, the 104... 149 million. 149 million, which is an extraordinary... I mean, in British Sinox terms, it's, of course, not very much money at all, but in an ordinary <laughs> person's terms, for you, me, anyone else in this country, 149 million is one hell of a lot to land in Would your Would you lap. want to win it, though, Cathy? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't actually know what to do with it. So uh, people might be watching this going, well, well, Cathy must have several hundred million in the bank to not no, want it. Uh, no, I, I don't have several hundred million in the bank to not want it. I'd find the responsibility o o overwhelming. Um, you'd have to think about setting up a charitable trust. You'd have to think about how to invest it properly. You'd be thinking of all the different causes you should give it to. Um, I think you'd probably nearly go crazy. And you'd begin to feel very guilty about spending any of it and on people yourself. Do. They're always, almost always morality tales of excess. Yes. The people who win these... Um, lottery, I mean, well, listen, I, I want you to keep giving your money to charity and buying lottery yes. tickets. I'm not trying to put you off. But if you win it, it doesn't necessarily mean that life becomes no. easier. It I, becomes much more complicated. Very complicated. I would say it's more blight than bliss. Um, I mean, I think winning enough money to buy the house of your dreams or winning enough money to, say, help get your children on yeah. the way with that, that's all great. Everybody wants that sort of money. But to win money that you could sort of set up a political party with, you know, may be great. <laughs> I mean, that's an idea. <laughs> you can give it to the Conservative oh. woman. Uh, right, we'll we leave it there because actually. I know what you're like. I think you will. <laughs> OK, uh, it is uh, five o'clock. You're with Bev Turner in for Colin Brazier on GB News, on TV, online and digital radio. Lots still to come in this hour. Hello, welcome. It is six o'clock. You're watching Brazier with me, Bev Turner, standing in. No, it's not. It's five o'clock. I've not done this show before. I don't know what time <laughs> it is. Uh, so I'm here until six o'clock, coming up live at five. Invest, train and innovate. The rallying cry to business leaders by the Chancellor Rishi Sunak during a speech last night. Speaking to the Confederation of British Industry, he promised businesses tax cuts only if they help him to boost productivity in the UK. But he offered very little detail on how he will support families through the cost of living crisis. Some business leaders suggest Rishi's announcement has put too much pressure on British business. Reaction next. The United Nations says Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The conflict has cut off supplies from Ukraine's ports, which once exported vast amounts of cooking oil, as well as cereals like maize and wheat. We're going to be finding out whether UK manufacturers can fill that void. And before six o'clock, we will bring you the reaction to the final day of the Wagatha Christie libel trial between Rebecca, Bard Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney at the High Court. And alongside me for the next two hours, having her say on the stories of the day, the editor of Conservative Woman, my kind of woman, full of common sense and experience, Kathy Gingell. Kathy, thank you. thank you so much for being here. Uh, but first of all, here are the latest news headlines with Polly.
Thanks, Mayor. The top story, the Prime Minister's been told he won't receive a second fine for breaching Covid laws. The Metropolitan Police has now concluded its investigation into parties at Downing Street and Whitehall. In total, 126 referrals have been made for fixed penalty notices for breaking lockdown rules during the pandemic. 83 people received fines. 28 of them were given between two and five referrals. A musician fascinated by serial killers has been jailed for life for the murder of Bobby Ann McLeod. The 18-year-old was hit twice on the head while she waited for a bus in Plymouth last November. Cody Ackland then put her in his car and killed her in a remote car park on Dartmoor. He'll serve a minimum of 31 years. Outside court, Detective Superintendent Mike West read out a statement on behalf of the teenager's family. I want Cody Ackland to know that he has taken away our world. We will never see her beautiful face or hear her laugh, see her get married or have the children that she so wanted. We've not been able to say goodbye to Bobby Ann and we can only imagine the things that he did to her. Downing Street denies blocking the Treasury from imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. The Prime Minister's official spokesman has acknowledged reports of division between the departments, but insists Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are aligned on the issue. The Chancellor is under mounting pressure now to produce a package of support after inflation hit a 40-year high. Rishi Sunak says the government is prepared to help families cope with rising costs, but Labour leader Sakir Starmer says more needs to be done. People are really struggling with their bills. Inflation's up, prices are up, wages are down, and the government is imposing tax on them at the same time. And he's got no answers. Um, and he had the opportunity. One of the answers is staring the Prime Minister in the face, a windfall tax to reduce bills by up to £600 for those that most need it on the profits that oil and gas companies didn't need, uh, didn't expect to make. I think the Prime Minister will U-turn on this, um, but the, by the time he's done that, so many people will have struggled with their bills for so much longer. Finland and Sweden say they'll address Turkey's concerns over their NATO ambitions with discussions to continue in the coming days. The leaders are in Washington meeting President Biden, who says both countries meet all NATO requirements. He's submitting paperwork to the US Congress for speedy approval if all 30 NATO members agree the expansion. Today I'm proud to welcome and offer the strong support of the United States for the applications of two great democracies and two close, highly capable partners to join the strongest, most powerful defensive alliance in the history of the world. And having two new NATO members in the high north will enhance the security of our alliance and deepen our security cooperation across the board. The United Nations is warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The UN Secretary General says the situation could lead to tens of millions of people facing food insecurity and even famine. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies. The wars led to soaring global wheat prices. Well, Antonio Guterres is appealing now to Moscow to allow the safe export of grain still stored at Ukrainian ports. Any meaningful solution to global field insecurity requires reintegrating Ukraine's agricultural production and the food and fertilizer production of Russia and Belarus into old markets despite the war. We are working to find a package deal that will enable Ukraine to export food, not only by train, but through the Black Sea, and that will bring Russian food and fertilizer production to world markets without restrictions. Here, the Royal Mail says it's going to increase its prices and cut costs by more than £350 million because of rising inflation. The firm says it faces higher wage demands and steeper energy and fuel costs. Royal Mail insists no further job losses are planned. That's after announcing in January that 700 managerial positions would go. The winners of the UK's biggest ever lottery prize have been revealed. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million jackpot 
on a lucky dip ticket. The Gloucester couple, who've been married for 11 years, said they now have time to dream. You're with GB News. More news as it happens. Now back to Bev Turner. Now, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has called on businesses to help ease the cost of living pressures by boosting investment and training in order to grow the economy. He made the comments in a speech at a Confederation of British Industry dinner last night, where he also warned there was no easy fix for the cost of living crisis. The Chancellor says that government action could only go so far and that action was needed from the private sector. We need you, the wealth creators the entrepreneurs, the leaders. We need you to invest more, train more and innovate more. And as I've said previously, our firm plan is to reduce and reform your taxes to support you to do all three of those things. That is the path to higher productivity, higher living standards and a more prosperous and secure future. He also confirmed that they will be, there will be tax cuts for businesses in the autumn. Uh, joining me now is Sebastian Milbank, the online editor of The Critic magazine. Sebastian, good afternoon, evening. Uh, is the Chancellor right to say that it is, to an extent, the responsibility of businesses to ease the cost of living crisis? Well, I mean, it's certainly the responsibility of businesses, but I think he needs to look to his own house and to government failure. You know, the, so far, it's not just the Treasury's job to produce growth. Every part of government needs to have a role in generating growth um, in all areas of policy, and that's been a singular failure. And I also think we need to throw aside um, the taboos of left and right um, in this endeavour. So, you know, things like net zero, opposition to fracking, the, uh, as well as opposition to government intervention in the economy, direct investment and stimulus, uh, even nationalisation of some sets of the economy. All of this needs to be on the table because we are facing catastrophic economic circumstances. You know, we're seeing inflation that like we haven't seen in a generation. We're seeing long-term damage to the economy, generational poverty. You know, th this is this is an emergency, and Rishi Sunak's acting like it's just a bad day for the economy. This isn't a bad day. This is a bad decade. This is a bad mm. thirty years. Mm. So, so what does he know that we don't in that case? Because to all of us on the outside. As you say, it's, it's pretty obvious that, that it feels desperate even just filling up our supermarket trolleys at the moment or getting the utility bills are extortionate. Why is he so relaxed about it? Well, um, a cynical man might say that Rishi Sunak is an extremely wealthy man um, and that he's in a government department that's one of the most unaccountable, that it's one of the most dominated by civil servants and transients, um, and that he himself is captured by those interests to quite a large degree. Um, the, the, and, the, and, and nothing that Sunak has done so far reflects what he said today. He hasn't, he's been increasing taxes um, on his watch. Um, he's been spending uh, in areas that generally do not reflect uh, inv you know, capital investment. Um, he, he hasn't produced a pro-drove agenda so far. Uh, he's very. He's coming very late in the game, if if that's his real view. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much. I want to to bring in our, our studio guest, well, uh, Sebastian Milbank, there, online editor of uh, the Critic. Kathy, we're hearing Sebastian then talk about the fact that it might just be that these are politicians who are slightly detached from reality. You've met and known a lot of politicians over the years. Are this group? particularly of that ilk, in terms of being detached from the reality of normal people? Well, I think so. And I think we've never had a set of politicians who are so irresponsible in government and who are so reckless with public money. I mean, everything the editor of The Critic said was actually quite right. We're heading not, not for a few months of difficulty on inflation, on inflation. This is decades. It may, it may be two decades. This is a generational um, thing. And these, these particular people in power, 
seem to have no awareness or conscience about it. I, I, I don't... They're suicidal almost in what they've inflicted on the country. And, yes, there are reams of government spending that could be retrenched, pulled back, so that money could be found for other things to help people. Um, we've got loads of... The, the regulation of industry, the diversity compliances, the green compliances. Every company is having to spend masses of money on this. This could be freed up by government lifting half of these ridiculous, highly interventionist rules. So, in, in a sense, rules. what you're saying is when he was talking at the Confederation of Businesses last yeah. night, he wasn't just um, displaying that he's out of touch with normal people, but he's also out of touch with what's bothering businesses. I think so. He's asking them to innovate. I thought it was a very interesting word, wasn't yeah. it? Move with the times, yeah. change the complexion of your business, maybe change your employment yeah. structure. What do you think he meant by that? Well, well goodness only knows it's words. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're hamstrung <laughs> by government. They can't move. If they don't employ this number of people in, from that colour or that number of people from that age or that number of people from that sex, you know, they have no freedom businesses and they're scared. They're all terrified of not being woke because they're going to come down with a hate crime. So he needs to lift all this ridiculous stuff. The country's no longer free. Business is no longer free. Yes, you need to have your proper practices, that sort of thing. But they have imposed so much on business. Corporation tax could be brought down. There's loads of businesses' competitive potential that they government stymies at the moment. OK, thank you, Cathy. Now, the United Nations says that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The organisation's secretary-general says that the war has worsened food insecurity in poorer nations due to rising prices. Some countries could face long-term famine if Ukraine's exports are not restored to pre-war levels. Global pr food prices are almost 30% higher than the same time last year. But with the risk of food shortages, can UK manufacturers plug the gap? And what are the logistics involved? Well, I'm joined now by Dan Wallace, who planted his wheat crop early this spring, anticipating increased demand. Dan, hi, thank you very much for joining yeah, us. Um, why did you come to that decision? Did you have a, do you have a little crystal ball, Dan, telling you that we were going to be in trouble later on this year? No. <laughs> I wish I did. I think I'd be a wealthier man. However, I, the problems with uh, supply and demand have been there for some time. This isn't a new phenomenon that we're short. The fact that consumption is outstripping supply has been creeping up for the, probably the last 10 or 12 years. Um, and government policy has been certainly promoting the environmental side of countryside management, not the food production. It's been largely forgotten about as a poor relation to the reality. And it doesn't take too many, uh, let's say, natural disasters, let alone man-made ones, what's going on in Ukraine, to cause, you know, a real shortage in supply. That you've got to remember, these food food chains, supply chains are very small. You know, they're very fast acting. You know, they're they're, they're not. There's not a lot of uh, give in the system anymore. And when you see it stretched, a with COVID, and then we've seen it stretch further with uh, what's happening in Ukraine. You know, you, you you're really seeing the, the 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 outset of the market. You know, um, can we fulfil it? Well, we've planted extra wheat this year um, because we were able to secure inputs, which were a sensible level that allowed us to do that. However, you know, many farmers haven't been able to do that because the inputs, what you're seeing in inflation, we've seen in agriculture as well. Our fertilizer, our pesticides, our machinery, our fuel, everything has increased between 40 and 60 percent. You know, so we're working on the tighter margin, but the opportunity is there for us to produce more. Um, so the UK, some, yeah. some countries, Dan, yeah. I was just saying, some, some countries have actually, I think India is one of the countries who would have now outlawed or, or ruled out uh, passed legislation within India to not export any of their wheat. They are hanging yeah. on to it. In the UK, do we export much of our wheat anyway or do we normally just provide it to the domestic market? No, we, we, we produce something in the order of about 14 to 15 million tonnes um, in most years, we would export between one and a half to two million tons out of the country. We're actually, a, you know, a, a, you know, we, we don't import anything, um, so we're able to fulfil our needs. You know, this is why it's probably been left as a poor relation. 
However, we've got the opportunity now to export more. We could produce mm. more, a lot more in this country, and we could export more as a country. We could do so much more. We're a, one of the best food producers in the world. You know, our quality is superb, whether it's livestock or, or wheat. You know, we're, we're some of the best farmers in the world. Mm. You know, we've got the ability. We, we could do so much more. You know, so, we, we just need uh, government so, policy to come with us. So if, if I've understood you correctly then, Dan, there might be some farmers like yourself who thought ahead who can, uh, I don't want to say take advantage because that sounds, that doesn't sound as complimentary as I intend it to, but yeah. you can, um, yeah. you can make a business opportunity out of this situation for you yeah. within, yeah. within sort of moral <laughs> food supply, <laughs> reasonable it's, kind of behaviour. Yeah, I know where you're coming from because... It you know is what I mean? I'm not, you're not capitalising on the war really is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, we are running a business at the end of the day, and like any business, we have to react to the market. We have to do the right things. And don't forget, you know, in my lifetime of, of, of growing wheat, I remember selling wheat at £57 a tonne. And, you know, I'm not that old. There's not that many grey hairs there yet. So it's not long ago we were giving the stuff away because nobody wanted it. And how and much is it a tonne now? Uh, today's price, it would be something in the order of 340 to 350 pounds mm. a ton. Um, last year, we were trading at something around about 150 to 180 pounds a ton, which was good prices. So it's but on the back, you know, the fertilizer mm. price, uh, which is directly. Mm. Oh, we've lost Dan. We need to move on. Anyway, uh, Dan Wallace there, who's a farmer uh, from Newbury. Kathy, I. I Listening to someone like Dan saying it was obvious that we were going to have a wheat yeah. shortage, and also, also we had a terrible harvest in the UK last year because the weather was we had so much rain during that period of time. Um, should should more have been done ahead of time to well, prevent this happening? Well, we should have always looked to our food security. We stopped looking to our food security and assumed we'd have massive imports. Um, what's astonishing? He's taken an entrepreneurial, very sensible, very admirable. Um, um, position on this. But I, I've heard of other farmers, in fact, I know one, who, with the government's rewilding scheme, mm. has bought a farm simply to make an income from the government grants that he'll get for sitting with the farm doing nothing. So at the moment, we've got this ridiculous, Rishi Sunak could do that again. All the farms that people are now buying in order to get rewilding grants, they should be put to food production. We need to up our food production in this country. Of course we can. This is, again, crazy. This is just, again, irresponsible. We, you know, we take in, we expand our population. That's probably quite irresponsible too. But if you're going to do that, you have to look to your basic um, needs and your infrastructure and your commodities. And we can produce more food in this country, but we can't if they have ridiculous rewilding policies and make it so um, advantageous for farmers to do nothing. OK. All right. Thank you, uh, Cathy. Right, moving on. Now, today, lawmakers and representatives from the European Commission have been debating alleged war crimes committed in Ukraine, hours after a Russian soldier pleaded guilty to killing an unarmed civilian in the country. Vadim Shishimaran, who's a 21-year-old tank commander, admitted to shooting a 62-year-old man. So far, Ukraine has identified over 10,000 possible war crimes committed by the Russian army. Joining me now is Professor David Crane, founder of the Global Accountability Network. Good evening, David. Um, tell us about this particular case, if you would, and exactly what happened. Well, this case is really important uh, at many levels, one of which it's a marker by which we show the world, particularly the Russian Federation, that Ukraine is following the rule of law and, and, and taking the rule of law and holding those accountable who commit uh, uh, violations of the laws of armed conflict, which is a war crime. We have a young soldier here, tank commander, sergeant, uh, who uh, uh, killed a civilian, totally prohibited under the laws of armed conflict. So uh, the fact that he's pled guilty is also important because he realized uh, that he was caught and uh, that uh, perhaps he would have a more lenient sentence. But really, at the end of the day, what I think the prosecutor general of the Ukraine is doing, and I think it's really smart, is, is, is laying down a marker, letting folks know that uh, uh, members of uh, armed forces who commit violations of the laws of armed conflict and also Ukrainian 
uh, domestic law are going to be held accountable. So this should send a signal to the commanders, uh, uh, Russian commanders that are still in the Ukraine, uh, that uh, you know they're going to be held accountable for this. And so I, I applaud this. I think it's a great move forward, and uh, and they'll continue to follow the rule of law and seeking justice for the people of Ukraine. So do you think, David, that perhaps some of the Russian commanders on the ground in Ukraine, particularly at the beginning of this conflict, didn't see this panning out in this way? They didn't see that war crimes would be tried at all, never mind within the first three months of, of war breaking out? No, I think it's to the contrary. Uh, uh, profession, commanders of professional armed forces uh, uh, have to follow the laws of armed conflict. They're supposed to train their soldiers in the laws of armed conflict. And they know that if they commit violations of, uh, of these laws, that they're going to be held accountable. Sadly, the Soviet and then the Russian Federation forces uh, normally do not train in, uh, in the laws of armed conflict. Their soldiers know nothing about it. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a sad commentary, but uh, professional armed forces around the world particularly in the NATO countries, uh, do follow the laws of armed conflict, train in the laws of armed conflict, ensure that their commanders are following the laws of armed conflict. Mm. Would it be any sort of defence for a soldier in this position, a, a young 21-year-old, maybe, maybe not even be a, a trained soldier, perhaps um, conscripted into the army for, under Putin? Would it be a defence of his to say, I thought I was in a war situation, I didn't realise I was breaking the law? Uh, no, it's not a defense. Ignorance of the law is not a defense. Also, uh, you can't use the defense that I was told to do this. My superior order, my superior commanders told me to, uh, to kill civilians. There's no defense of superior orders uh, in, uh, in uh, this uh, area of the law. So, uh, you know, he has no defense uh, on, those, on those issues. If a commander tells a soldier to kill that civilian, uh, that soldier has an obligation under the laws of armed conflict and under uh, NATO rules is to question uh, the uh, unauthorized uh, orders of their commanders. And in this situation, uh, he did not. So therefore, he is culpable for the murder of that civilian in Bucha. OK, thank you. Uh, Professor David Crane, their founder of the Global Accountability Network. Uh, and and, and as, as David said there, probably, hopefully, if they hear about it, it sends a very strong message to other soldiers on the ground. OK, you are with Bev Turner. Stunning in for Colin Brazier. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up, we'll bring you reaction to the final day of the Wagatha Christie libel trial between Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney at the High Court. We're going to be back with that in just a moment. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Welcome back. Good evening. You're here with Bev Turner in for Colin Brazier on GB News, on TV and on radio. OK, this afternoon, as the Wagatha Christie libel trial draws to a close, Rebecca Vardy's barrister has been giving his closing speech as he defends his client from accusations of lying under oath. The case is estimated to have cost £3 million and has seen testimony from former footballer Wayne Rooney as well as his wife, Colleen. I'm joined now by Paul Dudridge, host of the Politics People podcast. Paul, this case has been the talk of the papers for the last couple of weeks. What is the latest? Well, yeah, in this case, just to summarise, is really Rebecca Vardy's attempt to prove that she's like one of the few British celebrities who isn't tipping off journalists and selling stories. So it's important for reputationally that, uh, that this goes her way. Uh, the reaction, I'm in the United States, so I can only give you the objective reaction. And this is one of the great tragedies of this case uh, for all those participants is that it's been the timing couldn't be worse. It's been overshadowed, obviously, here by Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. But for Brit news nerds like me, it's just been a feast. It's been wonderful. We can start the day with, uh, with Vardy and Rooney. And then in the afternoon, we've got uh, Herd and Depp. So it's uh, <laughs> it's been a smorgasbord. But no, it's it, the reaction. Well, that means you, your professional is job is, been... is, is um, sort of um, sh schadenfreude. Is that how we're, you know, kind of taking pleasure in other people's misfortune, plus a little bit of voyeuristic insight? That's no, that's no brag, Paul. What voyeur... do you get out of these cases? I, I... I couldn't care less. Well, there is the couldn't care less clause as well. I have to say this would have been far... If they could have done this under lockdown, we could have all justified our uh, prurience. But yes, no, I, I don't... I really don't revel in their... Um, I don't revel in their misfortune at all. But, I mean, as, as, as misfortunes go, three million quid to bandy about just because you're having a squabble over the garden fence is kind of... It is all self-inflicted, it feels, whichever way this goes. Do we have a sense of which way it is going to go at the moment, do you think? Is, is Rebecca yeah. Vardy going to walk <laughs> yeah, out Colleen's of there being fully win. vindicated? Yeah. So, say again, Paul. Yeah, Colleen is going to win, yes. <laughs> that, that's how it seems to me. I don't, unless, there is a, an, unless there is a mass misreporting of this case, I think that anybody looking at this objectively, and I'm protected by the First Amendment, so I can say... Please, please don't take your cell phone to the North Sea because you're liable to drop it in. When a lot of your evidence, bearing in mind that Rebecca Vardy brought the case, a lot of your evidence is actually in Davy Jones's locker. We all came to uh, hear that sort of being uh, delved into and analysed. When your case is actually literally at the bottom of the ocean, it does seem unlikely that uh, you've got a strong enough point to uh, win. And this is a civil action. You only have to, I think it's a civil action. You only have to win 51% of the argument for it to actually stand. I'm not a legal scholar, but that's my understanding. And it looks like uh, Colleen has made 51% of the case quite comfortably. OK, all right. Well, we we'll wait to hear the final verdict. But thank you very much from your little sound booth there in America. Paul Dudridge, host of the <laughs> Politics People podcast. Kathy, a grotesque amount of money, three million pounds uh, on lawyers fees for what is basically a vanity project. Yeah. Is that harsh? Um, no, it's not harsh at all. I mean, there's a book published um, a few years ago called The Epid the narcissism epidemic. This is just this sort of peak of this sheer self interest, narcissism, women behaving badly. It used to be men behaving badly, now it's women behaving badly. It's like, great for feminism, women just sort of took on like the worst things that men did, you know, that, that it's not good. This sort of type of bad behaviour should never have even got to the courts. They should have been able, two decent people should have been able to say, ooh, I did it or I didn't do it, or yeah. sorry, or I believe you or I don't believe you. This is sort of crazy stuff. I wonder though, I do wonder whether, I mean, They've been wearing their designer outfits, oh, yes. arriving at court with the paparazzi it's flashing. All, it's all I me, can't me, help me, it, even if it's a it? subconscious driver for the attention, isn't it? It's massive attention seeking, massive narcissism, massive, what was the other word, indulgence. This is self indulgence. One, I know these are probably criminal cases, but one thing I looked at there are, there's a backlog of 40,000 court cases 
in this country at the moment. And then we have this running soap opera here with these silly women, sorry, and their silly husbands who all acting Mr. Big. It's like, yeah. have any of them ever learned how to behave properly? Sorry. I know. I don't I know. know. I know. I know. I give up. Right. OK, don't give up, <laughs> Catherine. We need you. Don't give up. All right, coming up, we're going to debate the big topic of the day, as I ask. Would you trust a virtual doctor with your life. NHS doctors say the pandemic has shown they can care for patients effectively from home. With a computer on wheels, robots basically, that allow doctors to travel from patient to patient doing their rounds. We're going to discuss that next, but first let's bring you up to date with the latest news headlines. The top stories this hour, Boris Johnson has been told he won't receive a second fine for breaching Covid laws. The Metropolitan Police has now concluded its investigation into parties at Downing Street and Whitehall at a cost of £460,000. A total of 126 referrals have been made for fixed penalty notices. A musician obsessed with serial killers has been jailed for life for the murder of Bobby Ann McLeod. The 18-year-old was hit twice while she waited for a bus in Plymouth in November last year. Cody Ackland later killed her in a remote car park on Dartmoor. He'll serve a minimum of 31 years. The Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation is now advising that all people over the age of 65 should be offered a Covid booster jab this autumn. The UK Health Security Agency says the current view is that frontline workers and those in clinical risk groups should also be vaccinated. The United Nations is warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The UN Secretary-General says the situation could lead to tens of millions of people facing food insecurity and even famine. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies. The wars led to soaring global prices. And Joe and Jess Thwaite have been revealed as the UK's biggest ever lottery winners. They claimed a record-breaking £184 million jackpot all on a lucky dip ticket. The Gloucester couple, who've been married for 11 years, say they now have time to dream. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+, you with GB News. Bev Turner will be here in just a moment. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Quick look at the markets for you. The pound is 1.250 to the dollar, 1.181 to the euro. And the price of gold currently standing at £1,473.13 an ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good evening, this is GB News. You're with Bev Turner on TV, online and on digital radio. The top story is just after 5.30 this afternoon. The Chancellor is facing increasing pressure to offer more support for families struggling with the cost of living crisis. Rishi Sunak says the government will act where it can, but it won't be easy to cut costs for families. The police investigation into Downing Street parties has concluded with a total of 126 fines handed out to 38 people. Downing Street says there'll be no further action against the Prime Minister, who has already received one fine over a birthday gathering. His wife Carrie and Chancellor Rishi Sunak also received a fine. And a couple from Gloucester have announced that they are the lucky winners of the UK's biggest ever Euro Millions win. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million last week, and that makes them richer than Adele. Now... Talking of rich people, uh, Prince Charles and Camilla are on their way to Yellowknife on the last leg of their Canadian tour. They've been in Ottawa today and I'm joined now by GB News' royal reporter Cameron Walker who is there following the royal tour. Cameron, tell us what Prince Charles and Camilla have been up to and are you enjoying it out there in Canada on what I presume, Cameron, is your first royal tour for GB News? Hello, Bev. Yes, it is very much my first Royal Tour for GB News. We had amazing weather yesterday, uh, actually, in Ottawa. It was blue sky and sunshine. It was really warm. I got a bit of a sun sunburn, so did my uh, cameraman. Uh, but on my first day here and today, it's been pouring down with rain. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about what they've been getting up to. So on the first day of the Royal Tour, which is to celebrate Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, uh, Prince Charles and Camilla were uh, in Newfoundland, um, in the kind of the east, east of the country. Uh, and there, there was a bit of kind of uh, addressing of reconciliations with uh, indigenous people. So uh, the, Prince Charles kind of vowed to learn from Canadians as what's being described as embarking on a journey of uh, reconciliation. He described it um, as they come to terms with darker and more difficult aspects of the past. And this is because of the discovery of unmarked, gra uh, unmarked graves of hundreds of indigenous children who were lost in a residential school system here in Canada in the 19th and 20th centuries. That happened last year. Um, there were several protests and there have been calls from the indigenous community here in Canada for Her Majesty the Queen and for other members of the royal family to apologise uh, for those kind of past wrongdoings. Interestingly, though, in a speech on the first day, Prince Charles stops short of um, apologising uh, for that. And interestingly, a couple of months ago, Bev, you might remember that uh, Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, also stopped short of apologising um, for slavery, the, the links, the historical links which uh, the royal family had uh, to the slave trade. But you know, many people are actually questioning why should members of the royal family have to apologise for uh, either historical wrongdoings or, or stuff which happened before those, you know, people were actually mm. born. So uh, in the last couple of hours, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall have now left Ottawa. They flew uh, out and they are currently en route to Yellowknife, which is in the far northwest of the country. Uh, but yesterday they attended uh, an event with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They attended their uh, musical ride, which is a big spectacular, uh, involving many, many uh, Horses that, and they looked like they were very much enjoying themselves. And it was the first uh, event um, that they had had done with a much larger crowd since uh, the pandemic. So it was a very special day for them uh, indeed. But as I just mentioned, they're going to be uh, in Yellowknife later on today and they're going to be spending more time actually with indigenous communities there the duchess of cornwall will be visiting a school get this beth this is a really really small school only 34 students are in it uh, and eight staff members and meanwhile uh, prince charles will be visiting the canadian rangers which is uh, kind of a branch of the armed forces here uh, in canada and they'll be marking uh, their 75th anniversary this year um, and they are actually kind of what part of their role 
is search and rescue, and they do a lot of work with uh, uh, helping people and saving people from floods and forest mm -hmm. fires. And this is something which has become a lot more frequent uh, up in Canada because of uh, climate change. So Prince Charles is going to be speaking to them about the impact this is having on those communities. He'll also be visiting a 6.4 kilometer ice road, which is being described as a lifeline for people living in Detta, which is a very remote community, which is only accessible by this natural ice road. Um, and because of global warming, again, uh, it obviously melts. And the only way to access this community uh, is by air. So it's been in the last couple of years, it's actually been open for a lot less time uh, than uh, than it would have otherwise been when it first opened. So Prince Charles is going to be uh, kind of highlighting the issues of climate change up in the northwest mm -hmm. here today. Uh, the Duchess of Cornwall will also be visiting a women's refuge centre, uh, some, somewhere which houses and supports women and children who have been victims uh, of domestic violence. And they're going to be ending their three-day tour um, of Canada with a celebration okay. of Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And then tonight they'll be travelling back to London, ready for the celebration weekend in just two weeks' time. Beth. OK, well done, Cameron. Thank you. Don't forget your sunscreen. Don't want to sound like your mother, but don't want you getting burnt out there. Uh, thank you very much. Busy old time, and it great advert for Canada, uh, isn't it? When, you know, they probably need it, given how Justin Trudeau treated the uh, truckers, Cathy. Exactly. But we can't get... We can't <laughs> talk about that. Right, it is time for the debate this hour. The British Medical Association has urged the government to seriously consider allowing doctors to continue working from home after the pandemic. The reasons why doctors are calling for the change included shielding consultants and stemming burnout. So this hour, I'm asking whether you would trust a, vi a virtual doctor with your life. And I'm joined by NHS doctor, Ra Dr. Raphael Oli Oliaya and editor of The Conservative Woman, Kathy Gingell, is still here with us. Um, Dr. Raphael, as a doctor, you knew your job was going to be hard. So the idea that doctors now have to work from home to avoid burnout baffles me somewhat. Can you explain that a little? So, of course, we have a lot of doctors moving abroad and actually stopping being doctors. And there's a shortage. You know, we have a, a percentage of what, 70 to 80 percent of dissatisfaction with NHS. And a lot of the reason for that is because they can't get a GP appointment. So, you know, we've got to look at, you know, what's the solution to the problem that we have? And it's that there's not enough doctors and there's not enough um, consultations to be had. So we want to make it easy as possible for doctors to, to work. So, and technology is moving forward at such a pace where, you know, virtual consultations, it's easy now. So there's really no argument against it. It's too easy. It's too easy to have a consultation down the, down the lens. I don't want necessarily to see a doctor through a camera. Um, Cathy, the idea that therefore it's easy, we should do it. I understand we've got to support doctors. They've got a flipping hard job. But what about the patients? It, well, it, it's that, but it's also we have a dysfunctional NHS and this will only make it more dysfunctional and this will make people not want to work in it anymore. You need to look much more clearly, if I may say, at the um, why, why doctors don't want to work. And the more depersonalised you get, the less satisfactory it is. And anyway, doctors will sit and get fat because if people sit at home and don't go out to work, they get fat. And that's one reason why we're getting such an obesity crisis. So this is only yeah. negative. Negative piled upon negative, I'm okay. afraid. Dr. Alaya, I have to let you come in here. You look like a strapping vision of a man to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think you've got a point there. You're talking about well-being and doctors' well-being is very important. Obesity, sedentary, and a lot of doctors are overweight and we need to do something <laughs> about it. However, the, the, our role is to um, look after and be the steward of the health of the nation. And what's the objective? It's not about convenience of patients feeling comfortable. It's about us looking after their health. And if that means we need to do consultations from home, then that's what we need to do because we're here to cure and treat illness and optimise the well-being, not to make people feel comfortable by seeing a doctor face to face. Because sometimes that doesn't add that much, and sometimes it can actually take away, as we've seen a lot of patients not being happy with some of their problems that come with waiting in the waiting room full of what 30 people. You know, we can see the problems with that. So it's about we need to be aligned on the goals here, not talking about what people want, because sometimes what people want is not aligned with the objective. But surely, you as, as a doctor, I don't know what your, your specialism is, um, but didn't you train to be a doctor in order to look a patient in the eye, to assess the whole person, to look at the non-verbal signs of illness 
And looking down a lens, there is an awful lot that you will not see. I think you've got a very good point there. And that is the reason why um, I came to medicine, you know, for that human connection and to you know, let them know that I care about them. And I, and I see that they benefit from that and they like that. However, you've got to think about, you know, as a, a community of healthcare practitioners, as a, as a structure, a machine, the NHS is a machine. You've got to think of, you know, we need to band together to look at the main objective. So we've got to put our, ourselves to one side and, you know, no one person's convenience is more important than the bigger picture. And that is health. Cathy, it, well, it's one, I'm hearing one size fits all. Well, that, that's your definition of health. So you're just saying whoever runs the NHS decides what's in the common good. A lot of people don't think that the NHS has been working in the common good recently, and certainly not for a lot of individuals. What you're describing is the ultimate example of producer capture, where you begin to run a service that's a service that we pay for by our taxes, that's meant to be for the patients, for the people, and you're running it all in your own interest. Now, it's not your fault that you work in a highly dysfunctional NHS, I grant. But really, this is the wrong way around that you're looking at it. And if you don't see a, a person walk into your room, if you can't see them, as, as Beverly said, if you can't look them in the eye, it is so easy to depersonalise that patient if you're only seeing them on a screen. And that's what's wrong with our society generally now. Depersonalise, depersonalise, inhumane. With that comes inhumanity. Yeah, I, I think you raise a good point. And on some of those points, you know, I agree with you. I, I can't disagree with you because it's all about that, that human connection and we don't want to depersonalize it because we, we became doctors for a reason. However, however, we have a problem in front of us. And right now the topic of discussion is face-to-face -face, uh, versus virtual consultations. And that's going to solve the immediate problem, the immediate problem, which is not enough. How, how can 80%, almost 80% of the UK be dissatisfied that's Can, embarrassing. So are you just saying, just so I'm completely clear, Dr Eli, are you saying that if you are doing consultations down the screen, the fact, the fact is you can get through more people than if you were, what, having to factor in a commute for you, for them? Is it just about the numbers? Yes, so it's more convenient and more doctors what? are going to be ready to work from home. And, and with technology what? adoption... Uh, is there another way of dealing with the numbers? Can I put to you something um, else? Is the, the, the National Health now is run by part-time workers. The majority of new doctors going into training, and it's, it, it's dominated, it's been dominated by women for quite a while, never want to work full-time for the NHS. They want to work family-friendly. Now the men are hooking onto this and saying, if they go family-friendly, we will too. So that's why we don't have enough doctors and enough appointments. I, I actually have... I, I'm OK with that to some extent. We have to accommodate families. We do have to... It depends what kind of country we need to live in. But maybe and, the and... solution, therefore, is not to get rid of flexible working, but to, what, more doctors, a better-run system? Sometimes these GP surgeries just lack leadership, don't they? I mean, how can we not be OK with a man wanting the same off time to maybe be a house dad, you know, equality? You well, know, what do you train we... for? You know, well, do we have careers and professions or are we all meant to be paid to stay at home to look let's, after let's, our children? Let's let our doctor have the last say. Sorry. Go on, go on, Dr Adaya. Like on the you. specific point that you mentioned about um, a lot of men wanting to be uh, part-time as well, we've got, to, we've got to think about equality here. We're in a time and an age where there's, we're yeah. asking lots of questions yeah. about who can do what. And I think the overarching answer is that everyone, depending on what kind of life they want, should be able to do it. It could be a house, a house, a house dad that wants to do that. You know, have you got anything to say to that? OK, I, do you know what? I could talk about this all night, but I, I know Jubes and Co will be on uh, after us and we do have to move it on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr Raphael Alaya. Thank you for the work that you do as well. OK, Cathy, take a breath. Right. OK. <laughs> he was very nice. He was very nice, man. Um, the winners of the record-breaking £184 million Euro Millions jackpot have gone public today. A couple from Gloucestershire became the biggest ever UK national lottery winners. When they scooped the prize, our reporter Jeff Moody was at their press conference earlier. <laughs> They're Britain's newest lottery winners, and they're the biggest too. £184,262,000 are heading into Joe and Jess Thwaites' bank account and life will never be the same again. They were telling me earlier that they were quite scared. Change is scary in the best times. When your whole life is about to change, it's very scary indeed. But they say as the days have moved on and they've got a little bit more used to their situation, they're not so scared now. It was Joe who found out they'd won. 
He was walking the dogs at five in the morning when he received the news so many of us have imagined, but so few have received. When his wife Jess woke up at eight, he told her, I've got a secret, I've got something to tell you. And they've been telling people ever since. Because it doesn't really look so real, I, I don't really know. You know I think we yeah. were scared right at the beginning. Yeah. But the more you get to understand it, the more yeah. scary it all yeah, becomes. But we, we just want to take yeah. the best advice that we can. Yeah, definitely, because of like questions today, the things that we haven't We don't even think about yet. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of things we haven't considered. And we've been so busy this week in trying to tie everything up with work and family and friends. So we really haven't had time to think about it. Yeah, so we're, we're looking forward to that then. A couple from Gloucestershire have just bought a house, but the roof leaks and money is tight. Now they say they'll buy a new car, spend some time taking in the news and dream. Jess runs a hairdressing salon with her sister and times have been tough. No plans to return to work just yet. For now, it's spending time with their children, working out what to do with their lives and sipping champagne. Jeff Moody, GB News. Oh, Kathy, can I tell them what you said? She said, yeah, I'll never get divorced. Now, we, do, we hope they don't get divorced. I'm sure they won't get divorced. But there'd be quite a lot of women out there, actually, and men, who might go, do you know what, if I had that much money, the first thing I'd do is leave my partner and go off with well, half Well, exactly. Of I want to say, first of all, really good luck to them. They I look do too. so nice. They do. They really look lovely. And uh, what I liked about her, she said they're scared, I think. Yeah. And they will be scared. And, and they need to keep that feeling, actually. I, I suspect, who am I to advise? I don't know. But keep the <laughs> feeling about being scared, because, God, it's a big thing. It's um, a huge Huge thing. It's, but you could live a life with such dignity with that amount of money. I mean, I guess they've gone public. I think they said they had to go public because they didn't think that they could ask all the people around them to keep it quiet. It was a too big a secret to give their, their friends and family. Um, but, you know... I mean, how do you live with the guilt of not giving a million away to this friend, a million away to that friend? A million... It's like, will everybody expect them to do oh, that? Who knows quite, it would be quite nice, though, wouldn't it? It would be quite nice to give away that money. I mean, yes. Um, right, we can, uh, we can but dream, Cathy. OK, up next, it is Jubes and Co with Michelle Jubry, who's here in the studio. What have you got coming up, Michelle? Hello. Well, never mind what I've got. I was just listening to those. Uh, that couple there with a lottery win, I tell you, Bev, nothing and no one would ever convince me to go public with a win like that if I had friends that couldn't keep a secret, guess what? I won't give them a penny of my money. That would seem feature, <laughs> wouldn't it? Uh, anyway, coming up on my show tonight, uh, I want to be asking, I've seen a book today, many of my uh, viewers might have seen it as well, all about sexual things for children aged four. Why, Bev, are we so obsessed with over-sexualising children? Also, uh, the new migrant centre in uh, Yorkshire opens imminently. Residents there are furious. They don't want it in their back garden, but if not there, then where? Also, why are still so many employers demanding that their employees are jabbed? I want to look at that. And crime. Should you be more lenient on people that are shoplifting because perhaps they can't afford their own food? I say no. But what will my viewers think? I'll see you very soon, everyone. A couple of minutes, in fact. Thank you, Michelle. And I would actually urge anybody, if they haven't seen the, the extract from the book that you're talking about, go and have a look at your Twitter feed because you put it on there. Uh, I did see well, it. Well, stay earlier. tuned, Bev. They'll it... be able to see it. And I spoke to the author, by the way, about what on earth she was thinking. Well, good, Michelle. If anyone's going to do it, it's going to be you, so I'm very pleased about that. Um, right, that is all that uh, I've, I've got time for today. I'm going to be sitting in on Saturday night uh, for Neil Oliver, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. I'm perfecting the long, shiny brown hair. Um, and uh, Colin will be back at 4pm on Monday. Next up, it's Jubes and Co. But first, I will leave you with the weather. Have a great evening. Hi there, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. Following the excitement of last night's thunderstorms, there have been a few more showers today, but actually most places are dry with sunny spells and high pressure ridging up from the south has allowed for light winds. So a pleasant end to Thursday for the vast majority, but the low out to the northwest will bring some more showers in during the next few days. We keep the clear spells into the evening for much of England and Wales, eastern and southern Scotland as well. Cloud coming and going for West.